ladies and gentlemen, presenting your winner, and new Man, I got chills watching that. I know. How do you not get excited for that? Welcome to the Grappling Bulletin Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Stockton, here as always with social media extraordinaire, Connor Joshin. I love that title every time. <laughs> Connor, how you feeling, man? I'm feeling great. Right after watching that you know, trailer, I'm, I'm more hyped for anything uh, than I have been in a long time. We got some great content coming out. We got some great grappling news to talk about. How are you, Corey? Ah uh, man, I, I I watched that that trailer and the the longer trailer, which we'll show you in a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, probably about a hundred times last night. Becoming Dangerous: The Rise of Giancarlo Bodoni feature film uh, coming out on January thirty first. Going through this tremendous, just as it says, just as the title says, this rise of Giancarlo Bodoni to what I would say is a, a division dark horse at ADCC in the eighty eight kilogram division where he was up against the likes of Ty Rutolo, Josh Hinger, uh, Wagner Rocha, Lucas Barboza, mm -hmm. Mateus Denise, the list goes on, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people counted Giancarlo out, but Giancarlo, I, it's it's uh, not enough really to say that he surprised us all, right? He shocked the world. He became the ADCC World Champion, submitting three of his opponents in the division, submitting Heisen Rita in the absolute division, and looking phenomenal. Uh, this is really kind of his rise to superstardom, and I can't wait for the film to come out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Dark Horse no longer. There will no longer be ever a time where Giancarlo Bodoni doesn't come into the division. At least one of the top favorites uh, to take it all, no matter kind of what division he's in. He put his stamp on ADCC 2022, and now we've got a film to commemorate it. If you guys were out at ADCC um, this year in Vegas with us, shout out you guys. I know some of our guys like Becerra was there. He got the hangout. But, man, whenever Giancarlo, pulled off some of those big upsets, whether it's over Hulk, whether it's over Mateus Denise is one that I can just remember very distinctly setting the world on fire. Everyone in there was out of their seats, you know, round of applause. And whenever he came around, he said, this is my house. <laughs> Dude, uh, th that's what we live for. You know, that's that's why we love the sport. So super exciting stuff. Stick around to the end of the show. We will air the full trailer. Uh, the film drops on Tuesday, January 31st. Mm -hmm. That's not the only news we have today about Giancarlo Bodoni. Uh, if you read the Grappling Bulletin article this morning, you would know Giancarlo Bodoni has a match scheduled to fight for the title on who's number one on February 25th, this time taking on light heavyweight champion Pedro Mourinho. Connor, what do you think about that matchup? Man, that's super exciting. We've had a lot of great who's number one cards. We've had a lot of great films. And Giancarlo's coming in. 2023's making a stamp on both of those. So not only the film, but we get this awesome matchup. And he's going for a title belt, a light heavyweight belt. This was actually scheduled before, I believe, for November. Um, that got moved. But, you know, we've seen a lot of a lot from both of these athletes. Very exciting stuff. I think last we saw Giancarlo and um, Pedro Mourinho was under ADCC rule sets that, um, you know, incentivizes a little bit of a different style of grappling. But under whose number one rules, you know, all bets are off. Who knows what happens? This could be good. Yeah, both these athletes have a very, I don't know if similar style, but a very ADCC friendly style. It also makes it. Uh, very exciting for who's number one matchup. Um, I don't know exactly how this match is going to play out. I, I know we've seen uh, both these guys, both of these guys submit each other in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, John Carlos submitted Pedro all the way back at Purple Belt, but Pedro has the more recent submission victory. He he submitted John Carlo at the Orlando Open back in 2021. It's been a while since they've uh, been on the mats together, uh, and they've both grown tremendously in the last year and a half. They certainly have, and, and you were just kind of reading off to me before the show some of Pedro Mourinho's big 2021 accomplishments, one of those being a, a Nogi World Championship over Cyborg and a bunch of other incredible names. So this is going to be super exciting. Um, however, this may be one of the times where we see a who's number one champ coming in not as the favorite. What do you think about that? I, I think it's too early to tell exactly who the favorite is, and I think Pedro Mourinho often gets counted out because of his loss to Gordon Ryan, but let's let's not forget. I mean, it's that, Gordon Ryan. Yeah, it's Gordon Ryan. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But I think the fact that that uh, Gordon was able to work through Pedro's game so easily is going to maybe bode well for John Carlos' chances. I'm sure they're strategizing together, but uh, but but Pedro, uh, he. 
He has beaten Giancarlo in the past. And mm -hmm. let's not forget, a lot of the things that Giancarlo excels at are going to be very hard to pull off against somebody as kind of relentless as Pedro Marino. Yeah, and, and specifically, if you know Pedro Marino, you know we may be talking about that dangerous guillotine, one of the most dangerous on earth. So trying to pin a guy like that down, take him to the mat, force him to be there, knowing that your path to do so is through one of the most dangerous submissions that he has in that guillotine, that makes it very difficult for anyone to want to really engage with him. Last time we saw Pedro Mourinho on the Who's Number One stage before the Gordon Ryan match was a Craig Jones match where he actually won the title belt. And, you know, there was a lot of fan criticism that maybe Craig Jones came in with more of a wrestle-heavy style that uh, favored Pedro's game. However, you know, that guillotine, I think, is, you know, something to be said for keeping Craig's wrestling very honest. You can't shoot in just willy-nilly. Um, and, you know, Pedro's really able to play into that game. So... We've seen that strategy play out for him before. Now, the question is, can Giancarlo kind of uh, work around that? I think the Donahair squad has a, a few really cool weapons of working around the guillotine threat whenever you're trying to threaten people with uh, takedowns. And a lot of that comes from the wrestle-up, right, which we see a lot of from that team. Right. Uh, and we're going to see, we're going to hear from both sides, both camps, uh, as they ramp up toward February 25th uh, in the co main event, the light heavyweight title on the line between Giancarlo Bodoni and Pedro Mourinho, the current champion. Uh, also on the card, the main event, February 25th, uh, Giancarlo's teammate, Gordon Ryan, mm -hmm. against, uh, against Pedro's teammate, Felipe Pena, in the fourth installment on the, of this match. It's uh, Gordon Ryan versus Felipe Pena. Two on Taylor, who's number one. Um, tickets on sale now. There's just a couple tickets left. Uh, go find the links. We'll put it in the description later on. Mm -hmm. uh, but tickets available for this event out in Costa Mesa. In the meantime, Corey, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can find those ticket links available at the link in our bio and our Instagram. Is that correct? In the bio and the Instagram, there are articles on the site. You should not have a hard time finding the ticket links. Yeah, and if you do, that's a you prop. No, I'm joking. Absolutely, we'll get that in the in the uh, comment section. Uh, but really exciting stuff. I mean, those are those are two um, main event, co-main event kind of matchups that I think may take the cake for most exciting we've had in a long time. Yeah, this this matchup, of course, a no time limit match, uh, kind of the, the the fourth installment, but the second edition of this on Tezos, who's number one uh, last time. The bout went to 44 minutes, and it was competitive, very competitive. I think a, a lot more competitive than uh, some fans might have expected at times, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't wait to see what this matchup looks like in another instance. Of course, this time, Felipe Pena has been uh, spending a little bit of his training camp over at Atos. He's training at Atos currently uh, with the likes of Andre Galvao, Kainan Duarte, and many others to prepare himself for the fourth match against Gordon Ryan. Yeah, which I think everyone's going to obviously point out. There's a little bit of a rivalry that has been uh, for several years between Gordon Ryan and Andre Galvao, which I think is going to be really helpful for Felipe, for Felipe Pena's training. Um, you got to think about you know that kind of. Um, training that goes into getting ready for about you know all of that homework all of that studying that's already been used on Gordon Ryan and, and the, the kind of system that they're working is going to be able to hand off to Felipe Pena in a way that's you know I think for athletes on that caliber on that level that kind of studying that kind of uh, work to get done is really helpful that yep. Invaluable, even. Not to mention just the caliber of the room, right? You're talking about training with multiple-time ADCC champion Kainan kind of Duarte, mm -hmm. uh, multiple, multiple-time ADCC champion Andre Galvao, and many others. So that room is only going to help to elevate Felipe Pena in this ramp up. And then, of course, the the uh, the, the match itself is right in the backyard of Atos over in Costa Mesa. So uh, maybe a little bit less travel, which who knows may may give uh, Pena a little bit of a of a boost here. Um, but fun that we're going to be kind of expanding who's number one out to uh, some different areas, right? Yeah. The, the very first who's number one was in Costa Mesa at the hangar. We'll be right back there for this one and uh, hoping to maybe expand uh, to some different territories a little bit later on. Super exciting. And I, I Corey, I may be wrong on this, but um, Galvao and Pena combined probably have more mat time with Gordon Ryan than anyone ever. I mean, how many how many people have even spent 45 minutes on a mat with anyone? And Felipe Pena did that in one of his yeah. three matches. Felipe Pena for sure has, I'm thinking, at least and two hours of mat time with Gordon Ryan between between all three matches. Yeah, and the Andre Galvao super fight wasn't a short one either. I mean, that went up until, what, the last five minutes or so? Yeah, it, it endured for sure. Um, Let's move on, shall we, to uh, to events that are maybe a little bit 
a little bit sooner on the, on the calendar. Uh, the IBJJF European Championships, of course, takes place starting off on the 23rd, next Monday, week from today, and running the entire week. Uh, through Sunday the 29th in Paris this mm-hmm. time. It's the first time the European Championships has ever been in Paris. Mm-hmm. Uh, they spent the last uh, last many years in, in Portugal yep. before moving to Italy and, and Rome last year. And Super now fun. headed to Par- Paris, France for the European Championships. Let me go and put this on record. Corey has been flaunting and gloating the fact that he's going to be spending the next few weeks in Paris, and I think we should revolt against him. But I'm excited for you to be able to go. I will not be able to join everyone in IVJJF Euros. Uh, you know, all the best to the athletes and, and the friends going out there. But, Corey, what are you most excited for? I mean, just there's a lot of things, right? Escargo. Escargo, for sure. For sure. Um, I'm a sucker. I'm, I'm always in it just for the international jiu-jitsu. I want to train at some different places. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know, man. Just – it's travel. You, you know? gonna bring your geese? For sure. I'm, bringing, I'm competing out there. <laughs> there you go. How much? How when you travel in your suitcase? How much of it is gi related? I mean, you know what a gi looks like. A gi is gonna <laughs> take up a lot of suitcase, regardless of how much suitcase you have, mm-hmm. right? So it's really just the trick is vacuum seal bags. Ah, there you go. That's a that's pro a pro tip, black belt right? trip right there. You can call him professor from now on. You hear that? Uh, I want to get onto some of the athletes who. I think surprisingly, at least to me, have moved uh, moved their weight categories uh, at Euros uh, mm-hmm. from from where we uh, specifically see them. So the the one that really jumped out to me was the 2022 light featherweight world champion Mayor Malvez. Uh, he he won at light feather, which is 141 pounds. He will be competing at Euros in the lightweight division, which is 163 pounds. That's two weight pounds. classes. That's a two weight class jump. Um, We've seen him there before. He did really well at BJJ Stars in the mm-hmm. lightweight bracket where he defeated two opponents and then lost a close match to Mateus Gabriel in the final. But Mateus Gabriel, Come one on. of the most decorated lightweights out there. Um, if you're going to lose to a lightweight, that may be the, the one to test yourself against. I mean, let's be real. For sure. And, and I'm trying to, I guess, wrap myself, wrap my head around what to make of this jump from Mayron Alves. I, I, I'm, doubt, I'm doubting that he gained 26 pounds in the last six months dude maybe maybe he does we see a, a jacked may come out and he just has like huge muscles everywhere but i don't know if that is going to be the case i think you got to look at some of the uh, names in his new weight class because it is not an easy weight class he didn't do this to avoid competition you got names in there like we said like mateus gabriel you have names in there like mika galvao tai ruotolo hanato canuto that's a huge step up in challenge but you know how do you think that kind of um, caliber name uh, lines up with the caliber over at light featherweight where he was previously competing in. Yeah, I mean, there's there's decorated opponents anywhere, right? Of and so part of part of maybe what I'm considering is I don't know if he's trying to distance himself from teammates or from fr- from friends in the light featherweight featherweight division, or if he's just looking for a new challenge. Like you said, uh, all of those names, all of those world champions or uh, world finalists, could be great matchups for him. J- just for clarity. Many of those names are not competing at Euros, but mm-hmm. there are still several uh, really, really decorated athletes that are competing at Euros in lightweight. I wouldn't be surprised if Mara Malvez, the way he is, is just looking for a new challenge. Yep. No, that makes total sense. And, you know, that's that's a really exciting um, kind of maneuver. I know we have a few of these other athletes that we kind of are looking at um, their moves in the same light of this isn't an avoidance maneuver. This isn't anything except a really exciting new chance to put them um, up against names that maybe you won't see outside of a super fight. Maybe you won't see outside of a BJJ stars. But I think on top of that, putting your name in the mix with some of those um, other names, not obviously at Euros because we're not getting, you know, all of the lightweight division's biggest stars competing at Euros specifically, but putting your, you know, name in the hat against a Tyru Atola or against a Mika Galvao or at least being in that division so that matchup makes up makes a lot of sense to me, especially for these guys that are coming through in the IBJJF. Maybe they've already won a world championship and now it's about how do I get my name out there on a stage in a way that's bigger than just a world championship. It is about your matchup with the biggest names in the sport. World championships, you know, those are great. He's won one, though. Now it's about what's the biggest storyline next, and I think the lightweight division is a really fun one for that. For sure. Let's talk, let's talk about another move, uh, Felipe Andrew, who has won Euros now four times, right? He won it in 2019 in the weight category. He won it in 2020. 
uh, in the Absolute Division. And then he took double gold last year, 2022. Uh, he is moving down from mm-hmm. super heavyweight, where he's been clearly dominant, to heavyweight. Um, I'm surprised at this change because Philippe Andrew has proven himself so dominant at super heavyweight for so long. Uh, but also kind of saw this coming in that he sh- has been playing around with weight categories in no-gi competition. Uh, and also at the World Pro, he competed at, I think it was 88 kilograms, which is substantially lower than he- than super heavyweight where he's been competing uh, very often in the past. What do you think about this change? Man, I thought it was super interesting. I think you see a little bit more of this and maybe some other combat sports where a guy does really well at a weight class above and then shoots down below because if they're already dominating at this top level, you know, why not the next weight class below where you're already pretty confident you can handle that level of strength, that level of competition. And, you know, the big names in heavyweight, uh, at least the major one that sticks out to me most years, is Kainan and Duarte. Now, there's two things with that. One, Felipe Ankelot Kainan in the absolute 2022 world championship. So it seems like if you're trying to, you know, weigh your options as far as where you go, you look at the main biggest name in the division below you and go, hey, I finished that guy last time. Why won't I make that jump? Uh, but even that, you know, I don't I don't know if we'll actually see a Kynan versus Felipe matchup in the weight class because it looks like Kynan may be flirting with a move himself. However, we don't have to get too much into that. I will say Felipe Andrew now, he doesn't always go as the most notorious or recognized person. However, he is one of the most active athletes on the IBJJF scene. He competes at every major, lots of these opens, and not only is he one of the most active, it's not just about how often he's competed. He's lost like four, five times. And in 2022, he lost to three people, Eric Munez, Gutenberg Pereira, and Nicholas Marigali, which everyone loses to Marigali. But if you're looking at that, I mean, you're putting yourself out there more than anyone else on the scene, and you're coming back with one of the highest win ratios possible, and he finishes everyone. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this, that I think Felipe Andrew is just chronically underrated mm-hmm. in that he, he is not just a winner, but as you said, Connor, he's a finisher. He's got that gnarly footlock. He's got a devastating triangle. Uh, Felipe Andrew just persistently kind of underappreciated, underrecognized. I think he's starting to, to gain some of that appreciation and a move to heavyweight and becoming a champion in multiple divisions might help that. I'm curious, and, and we don't have to get too much into this, I'm curious how that is going to affect his uh, his desire to continue competing in the absolute division where he's been so successful, not just at Euros, but also at Pans, also at Worlds in the past. Philippe Andrew has, has done very well in absolute divisions. Now, mm-hmm. cutting 13 pounds to get down to heavyweight could impact that, but who knows? I'm, I'm kind of digressing uh, because the same question can be asked about somebody you just mentioned, Kainan Duarte, who is, for Euros, moving from his heavyweight category where he's been very successful up to super heavyweight. Mm-hmm. So we got a little bit of a switcheroo here between Kynan and Felipe Andrew, which I don't really know what to take of it. I think uh, Kynan has been very successful within his own weight class, obviously. He's a world champion. Um, but you're right. Like Whenever you're looking at the absolute, that may be where he's kind of uh, met a few of his matches. Now the absolute obviously has these crazy names like who he ran into last year with Felipe Andrew. It also, you're going to run into you know the big names and the big guys, Nicholas Marigali. I mean, you're going going to run into these guys. Uh, Felipe Pena last year before he uh, bowed out of the IBJJF competition scene. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how he does at a bigger weight. I don't think, um, in, in my eyes, I don't think any of the times I've seen Kynan maybe not get the win over some of these names. It hasn't seemed to me that it's been a weight issue. But it could be, and this is just me speculating, it mm-hmm. could be a cut issue, right? Because mm-hmm. if Kynan's making heavyweight where he won Worlds uh, two years running, right? He won Worlds 2021, Worlds 2022. Um, making that cut can take a little bit off of you. And if you're also chasing an absolute title, those are pounds that you want for your endurance because you're not competing in just one, but two tournaments across two days. Yeah. Um, so perhaps that's it. Perhaps he's chasing the absolute title, which he... I, I was surprised when I read this last night that Kainan Duarte has not yet won a major absolute title. Not Pans, not Euros, not Brasileiros, not Worlds. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe that's his mission this year. I'd love to see it, and I think this change, if that's the case, makes a lot of sense. Um, how about another champion moving up, uh, the 2022 lightweight European champ, Espen Matisse, and we talked a little bit about him last week, making the jump from lightweight where he won last year up to middleweight. 
Yeah, I mean, that middleweight um, weight class, we talked about it a little bit last week, and I don't want to harp on it too much, but right now it is Tynan Dalper's weight class. Um, so, it, you know, I don't think anyone mistakes that. If you move into middleweight, you don't do it not realizing he's there. You know what I mean? Um, so I guess that really does come to mind. Like, what are you saying by changing, by making that conscious decision? You see Tynan's name in that division. You've seen his name stamped across the world champions, you know, ship um, brackets every time for the last two years. What are you saying whenever you see that challenge and go, yeah, I want it? Yeah, and I, one of the, the things I said last week that I'm going to stick to is Espen is a competitor, right? He's, he's a competitive athlete. He wants to win. He has to believe he can win. So that's the match that everybody – really in his perspective should be chasing but one other thing just crossed my mind you think we'll see espen in the, in the absolute division oh my gosh i mean i can only hope i love seeing the small guys go into the absolute because it does seem by and large that that is a little bit of a um like it's a little bit of a circus it's a performance when the small guy goes in very few people are looking for him to make it to the finals to actually win that absolute title and it is seen as like the big guy division right you expect the marigales and the kind is whatever but i would love to see espen go in there and just try and bear and bolo his way to absolute finals uh you know that's exciting to me i know mikey's one of the few competitors from you know the lighter weight classes that actually goes in there and puts his name in the ring for the absolute so let's keep adding those now i will say it's probably very rough on the body for those small <laughs> guys Corey. i can't imagine seeing you up against someone like a 240 or a 250 uh but you know i would be on your side if you did that and the the only really the only real reason that this came to me is i remember at euros a couple years back tommy who was a middleweight competing competing at middleweight did really well in in the absolute division uh he, he finished a couple of matches i don't remember if he medaled but these are the kind of things that I think European-born athletes just just want to do everything they can in front of their local localish audience, right? The the European jiu-jitsu community is small and tight knit, and all of the Euro-born athletes are going to be out there rooting for Tarek or Espen mm -hmm. or any of the other uh, European athletes there. So to be able to perform in the absolute division in front of your home crowd, I'm sure, is something that everybody at that caliber wants to be able to do. That's exactly right. And and uh, full disclosure for the entire tournament, that's kind of one of the things that excites me. I think we've um, had some criticism levied at us about not being able to pay as much attention to the European circuit as maybe we would like to. Um, you know, there's a lot of logistical reasons for why that is. However, Euros is the place for these European athletes to really show us like, hey, this is what you've been missing. Espen putting his name in the absolute or any of these underdogs, small guys putting their name in the absolute is the perfect way of just proving exactly you know how much they deserve a lot of this coverage we're talking about lightweights jumping into the absolute there was a, a featherweight in the in the uh, women's division that jumped into the absolute last year mm -hmm. Anna rodriguez uh generally a light featherweight she'll be competing again at featherweight this year she told us uh, uh earlier last week that she plans this year to try and tackle the grand slam in the Ooh. featherweight division she's already won each of the mother each of the majors at light featherweight uh she did euros at featherweight last year and then did the rest of her uh, campaign at Light Feather, but now uh, A Rod uh, seems to be maybe looking for new challenges at Featherweight. Which you got to like that. I know uh, recently she's matched up with Maisa quite a bit, uh, and Maisa does have a Grand Slam under her belt, so maybe this is another way of like, you know, whenever you're um, putting your accolades next to the next guy's. This is the perfect chance for her to do that. just that. I'm super excited. A-Rod goes out there ready to tear people's heads off no matter what. She's, um, you know, looking for the finish quite often. She has a great jiu-jitsu. Um, I'm excited to see how this plays out. Do you? Is there any particular matches ups in this weight class that you think are, you're going to be super excited to see? I'd have to pour through the, uh, the, the division again. I don't have it uh, in front of me, but... A Rod, I, I'm always just interested in watching what she can do in the absolute division, mm -hmm. just because it's like you said, it's that that kind of hero story, right? The the lighter weight divisions going up against anybody north of medium heavyweight is always just uh, you've got to root for the little guy, right? Mm -hmm. um, speaking of light featherweights moving into the featherweight category, Diogo Hayes, baby shark moving into featherweight uh, this time for Euros. He said he might spend 
the rest of the season at light featherweight, but for now he's in featherweight where, where he'll share the division with his teammate Fabrizio Andre. I think that's the really interesting part here. Now, um, they have faced off several times before. This was something they ran into quite a bit at ADCC. Fabrizio Andre recently sounded off and said, hey, if we do meet in the finals at IBJJF, in this weight class, we will face off. This isn't going to be a closeout situation, which we love to see. Our hearts go out to you guys. Thank you so much. Um, there's nothing worse than getting to the finals and realizing they're going to shake hands and the drama's off. However, moving up um, into that weight category with your teammate is very interesting, which it makes me question how much of a, a cut that must have been for him to make it down to the light featherweight weight class, whether that was just like too much for him. Um, you know, I, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are and maybe why this change happened. I have a theory uh, that Diogo was competing at light featherweight around June, right around Brasileiros in May and Worlds in June. And then he had to bulk up to 145 for ADCC. 145, especially if you're cutting down to 145, is much closer to featherweight category. I'd imagine he just uh, bulked up for ADCC and will probably start cutting back down toward the later half of the season. Um, but, yeah, it, surprising then that somebody like Diogo Hayes can make light featherweight on a consistent basis given that, I mean, I don't know if last time you saw Diogo, I, the last time I saw him at ADCC, just – floored how just shredded that guy is yeah i mean that team is always the thing you cannot say about them is they're not athletes right like every one of them is built ford tough right they are <laughs> they are straight out of uh, the jungles of manaus ready to rip people's heads off they also got great technique obviously but uh yeah diogo hayes that you know that is quite the move you're right though i i do understand if he's giving himself that i don't want to say giving himself an out quote unquote but if he's already saying straight up look guys I'm going to be doing this for the first part of, of the year. Maybe I'm not down to, what is it, light featherweight yet, but I may be later on. Understood, right? <laughs> Understood. Coming out of ADCC, you're going, hey, I'm going to keep training. I'm going to keep these training camps up so I'm still top of my game. But I'm, I don't want to drop 15 pounds on top <laughs> of that. Uh, totally understood. But super exciting. I'm glad we're getting a little bit of the Melky Galval team out there, uh, you know, at their first major under their new brand name. But they did compete recently, which I think we're going to get into a little bit later. Uh, you know, super exciting to see. Glad, glad we got Diogo out there in Paris with us. For sure. One more weight change I want to point out before we move on. Tarek Hopstock who was originally registered to compete in the middleweight division is jumping up to the medium heavyweight division and i, I kind of want to say jumping out of the frying pan that might be the tiny doll per show and directly into the fire because while there's some maybe unsung heroes at medium heavyweight any one of these matches i think with Tarek and any of these other guys in the mix is going to be just a barn burner i'm talking about francisco Lowe, jansen gomez mm -hmm. so many others just guys that i expect to bring the fight to the shoulder lock specialist yeah that's something that you always got to keep in mind whenever we're talking about someone who stamped their class or stamped their name on a weight class um obviously it's going to be very natural for people to um, vacate or do what they can to avoid being there in particular. However, that does make the weight class above and below it just as equally dangerous because you got all the guys that can go there and, and tear it up on the IBJJF scene but are going, well, I'll just step away from this weight class, maybe not be in Tynan's way here and still have my shot at, you know, the podium or whatever. And that just, that just makes it a very hard road for anyone that's, you know, trying to avoid Tynan and you run into all the high-level competitors that think they have what it, uh, what it takes to get a world championship at a weight class just above, above or below them. For sure. And with this move, I just I, I keep on running this match through my head. That is Tarek versus Francisco Lowe. I hope we get it. I hope we get it early when both these guys are fresh because mm -hmm. uh, Francisco just such a firecracker, right? And Tarek so calculated. So I, I can imagine that match ends in submission one way or the other. Um, I, I don't know what more to, to expect from or to say about that match. Uh, but that's all for the Euros weight changes. Like I said, the event kicks off on the 23rd on Monday mm -hmm. and will run all the way up to the 29th. The Black Belts take them out 28th and the 29th in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, before we get more onto the upcoming events, let's talk about the, the events that we just got through this weekend, the events that took place on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and I want to kick it off with Alex Enriquez. Ooh, man. I think we have something to show for her, but um, I will say this. Alex Enriquez, she 
Um, I don't know if she took it personally, what we said about uh, Grace Gundrum looking like no one can roll with her, but she decided to put it on. She put it on everyone through the tournament, and in the final, she got the win over Grace Gundrum. Yeah, Alex Enriquez had a phenomenal showing. So let's uh, kind of a reminder about how this uh, this tournament played out for the finishers' 125-pound Grand Prix. Alex Enriquez, by the way, the reigning 135-pound champion at finishers won the 125-pound belt that came with a $2,000 cash prize. Champ champ. Champ champ. But the way it was structured, there were two sets of four. Both of those sets of four were round-robin tournaments, Mm -hmm. and the winner of tournament A fought the winner of tournament B. Alex Enriquez had three matches on her side of the bracket. She submitted all three in less than four minutes total. Jeez, her man. average time on the mat was 70 seconds across those three matches. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just a clinic, right? She had a slick Dars in there. She had a nice arm bar. Very, very crafty rear naked choke set up. And, and Alex just really showed that she is a head and shoulders above these girls. Now, uh, I want to point out too, Grace Gundrum on her side of the bracket also submitted all three of her opponents. They met in the final. It was a 15-minute regulation period followed by three overtimes they went the full 25 minutes it was a long battle it ended up going to escape time uh to alex enriquez but close match and both grace and alex tremendous tremendously impressed yeah double champ alex enriquez if you did watch the actual final you'll see um alex ran into grace now it, it kind of slowed everything down right because alex did look like she was outclassing out create uh, creativing she was way more creative than, uh, you know, most of her opponents, and it really showed she got all those submissions uh, very quickly. But when she ran into Grace, you know, Grace's guard is one of those things that gives everyone trouble. Grace's inversions um, are very difficult to deal with, and this really did get solved in EBI over time, right? That's where this ended up getting uh, figured out, um, you know. Only serious regulation submission, I believe, was an arm saddle entry that could have looked like it was something, but even that was very, you know, it was a very shallow entry, which I think we got to give credit to Alex because despite not being able to find the hole in Grace's guard to actually pass, which very few people can, she was able to defend, you know, the kinds of submissions that make Grace so dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. And really impressed by Grace Conjurum, too, who has been kind of on a hiatus for. 15 months, maybe a little bit longer, in fact, uh, to come right back out like she hadn't missed a beat Mm -hmm. and submit her entire side of the division and then to take Alex Enriquez, who is naturally bigger. Remember, Grace competes generally 115. Alex more often competes at 135. So they meet in the middle. Alex, the, the bigger athlete here, and Grace, her guard held up for the duration of the match and into the overtime period. At that point, it's a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. And Alex did look much, much bigger than her more physically dominating, which is kind of the norm though. You know, whenever we see Grace out there, we don't see her winning because she's super jacked and throwing (laughs) people around. So this kind of did play directly into, uh, you know, what Grace excels at. And even then, you know, Alex got the win. I do want to call out though, Alex is not the only big winner that night. Trinity Pun also competed. Trinity scored a beautiful arm bar off of a – it was a jumping guard pool. Ended up, you know, kind of sitting around in that same guard sequence for a minute or two and then ended up in a beautiful arm bar. But also one of the big names that we've been, you know, paying attention to no matter, you know, what competition scene she may be taking part in. Trinity Pun, love to see it, you know. Yeah, a couple others too. Uh, Brittany Elkin defended her heavyweight title. Uh, Teresa Callaway took the 105-pound. Uh, what is that? Straw weight? Super no. small, just yeah. tiny. Adam weight, I think. Uh, <laughs> took the 105 pound title off of Face Sherrier. Uh, Pat Shigoli, the adult slayer, defended his heavyweight belt. And Dylan Garofalo won the 170, 170 pound belt, which had been vacated a couple weeks prior. Um, those athletes, not the only ones who impressed over the weekend. Uh, we can't let this go without talking about Melky Galvao's team and their performance at the Rio Open oh, yeah. uh, on Saturday and Sunday. Remember, this team. Probably 10, 15, 20 days old in the IBJJF books at this point. They brought out a huge team, 15 athletes, 14 of them medaled at the Rio Open, including several black belts. Uh, You see Fabricio Andre there. He took second. He closed out with his teammate. A ton of brown belt high-level competitors. Uh, But I want to shout out the black belts here. Um, uh, Yago Sequeira took uh, took featherweight gold, closing out with Fabricio. uh, Sorry, that featherweight gold. Fabricio took lightweight gold. He closed out with Alessandro Botello. Uh, Luis Paolo took silver. Brenda Larissa took gold. 
of Wallace and Fernandez took silver. The crowd then returned to the Rio Open Sunday, the, the Nogi part of the tournament, where they sent 13 athletes, and I think 11 of them medaled, uh, including uh, two of the brown belts who double, well, double closed out, let's call it, mm-hmm. right? Um, they, they closed out the weight category together, then closed out the absolute. They had previously, in the gi, closed out the weight category together. So <laughs> Melky's team already proving that they are going to be a force in yeah. the next couple of years. Yeah, coming straight from the jiu-jitsu motherland. We love to see it. We also had a few people down there embedded with them. You know, shout out OG Trey, shout out our vlog poppy, and shout out... Mike, right? I don't know if he's Podoroso Mike. I don't know if he's Hollywood Mike. Shout out shout out whichever version of him was down there. I know we got a lot of great content. If you guys are interested in seeing more or following along, you know, hop on their socials, hop on ours because there's so much cool stuff coming out of Brazil. One of the in fact, you know, we are talking about one of the critiques being maybe we don't cover Europe enough. That's also been a critique of Brazil. So we're sending people down there. We're trying to make sure that we get, you know, everything we can from what truly is the heartland of Jiu Jitsu. We joke about Austin being the new Mecca and you know, we love that, but realistically, we're so happy to be able to send guys down there. Now I just need to figure out who I need to convince to send your boy down there, right? How do we get down there, Let's guys? Let's make it work. Yeah. Uh, one more shout out here, Helen Akrivar. We talked about her last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, she successfully defended her title against the Nogi World Champ Nora Schultz. Uh, Nora Schultz, the Nogi World Double Gold Purple Belt Champ. Helena Krivar showed out in fashion. She really put Nora Schultz in danger. Of course, it was a submission only 15 minute, ma- uh, 10 minute match, I believe. The submission only. It went to overtime where Helena won by first takedown with basically a golden score format, right? First person to score wins. Um, Helena now representing New Wave. This was her first uh, her first major win under the New Wave banner. Uh, John Donaher made a comment uh, after the win. Here's what he had to say. Uh, yesterday, she had her first lo- local competition against an adult two-time world champion and won an overtime via takedown despite only working takedowns upon her arrival here in Texas a relatively short time ago, showing her hard work and excellent learning ability combined with her excellent ability to apply knowledge under pressure on a stage in, a ma- in match conditions against strong opponents. Well done, Helena. Um, of course... She is a consummate competitor, right? Mm-hmm. Despite despite just joining New Wave a couple of weeks back, she has been competing at the highest level for years and years. Mm-hmm. And if you ever watch um, any of her other matches, you know I think what really sticks out about this particular victory and something I think John pointed out in his own Instagram post. I will, John Donahue can do this way better than any of us can. But he pointed out, um, you know the. With wrestling being the deciding factor, that's something that's starkly different than what we normally see from Helena's jiu-jitsu style because she does have that very submission-oriented bottom game. She's very good at that, and you know we she doesn't shy away from wrestling at all, obviously. However, if you have a background in wrestling and you watch a lot of even high-level jiu-jitsu people do some wrestling, you can see that they're, you know, um, even in watching Helena's ADCC trials moments, there is something to be desired there. Um, and that just comes with a lot of reps, a lot of practice, and a lot of working with John Donahue. But to see, you know, from where we saw her at trials, maybe at the ADCC Open, where she successfully wrestled, but uh, still uh, obviously has a jiu jitsu game that favors bottom favors that kind of submission oriented approach to see her make that shift when you know it's really on the line when it's ot when you have to get the win when it's your first team uh, event with john donahair you know at your back that's that's the place to show up and shine and it shows a lot of improvement for sure and absolutely if you go through the the match if you go back and watch the replay uh, Helena did use a lot of her guard and a lot of the attacks that we've come to know her for, right? Mm-hmm. That incredibly flexible closed guard with those arm lock setups with the back attack setups. But credit to her to not finding success, the, the success re- required to win the match. Go on to something, a brand new skill set mm-hmm. and excel at it enough to, enough to win herself the match. Um, re- really great performance and I expect that we'll see a lot more of her, especially right here in Austin, Texas. Which is something we've seen bottom players struggle with quite a bit absolutely i want to move on to upcoming events Bef- before we do do we want to talk about some things like gary tonin mikey musumechi i didn't see that in the run of show but i, I wanted to make sure that we get that in because i feel like that may be relevant for sure yeah uh, gary tonin and mikey musumechi both successful at one mm-hmm. um this past weekend uh, gary tonin the two minute kimura to, yeah. to move on uh to to seven and one in his mma career i think it was a big rebound for him 
um, as he uh, he he lost his title match in his last match. I think it was last March. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a great opportunity for him to get back into number one contender territory. Uh, and Mikey Musumeci won. I was just baffled. It, it couldn't. <laughs> it wasn't a submission win, right? It was uh -huh. a decision win. Yeah. But he he essentially turned his opponent's legs into into pretzels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with that just savage savage Mikey lock. I think there's something to be said about like sure it wasn't submission, but like. If your opponent crawls off the mats, right, does that no longer count as finishing him? Like, all right, fine. Like, this is still a combat sports, though. And part of it is, like, can this guy keep going? And, you know, they put up, obviously, uh, a superstar in, you know, combat Sambo. He was from Mong Mongolia. He was a super game down competitor because if you're not game, you probably wouldn't have let every bone in your leg snap like he did. However, I think this just goes to show you know whenever we talk about these cross style cross discipline matches whether it's you know wrestling and jujitsu with tony ramos versus <laughs> versus nikki ryan whether it's sambo versus jujitsu with this match up here the leg locks are going to be really where you know the jujitsu guys come to play and where um you know any other style has a lot of work to make up for i think especially in sambo right where the rules on leg locks are a little bit restricted right and mm -hmm. th this is a discipline leg lock specifically where Mikey has really been dedicating a lot of his last uh, last year or so developing that Mikey lock, making it just as gruesome as I hadn't really imagined it to be <laughs> until until Friday night. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually had someone at the gym. They were like, Connor, you like ask me questions about the Mikey lock. Like, what's the I was like, dude, I don't know. He, Mikey Musumeci has explained exactly what it is point for point to me specifically. And all over my head, I'm too dumb for it. I don't know anything about it. Except that it looks like I don't want to get caught in it. <laughs> Let's move on to upcoming events. Yeah. Uh, I, want, I want to dive right here into the uh, IBJJF Flow Grappling Grand Prix. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we went through Euros quite a bit. So let's move right on to the IBJJF Flow Grappling Grand Prix taking place here on March 3rd. Now, last week we talked about Tynan Dalpera versus Izaki Bayens in the main event super fight. But we got the names of four athletes who will be competing in the respective Grand Prix's uh, the the men's lightweight Grand Prix going to feature Andy Murasaki and Jonathan Alves, and the women's heavyweight Grand Prix going to feature Andresa Sintra and Anna Carolina Vieira. A lot of champions in the mix, right? A Anna Carolina, five-time world champion. Andresa Sintra, three-time world champion. Jonathan Alves, two-time pan champion. And on, uh, Andy Murasaki, at least in his black belt career, perennially right on the cusp, right? He, he's, uh, he's a pan silver medalist, a world silver medalist. He's right there. So this GP, which is going to have two more athletes on each side uh, in the coming weeks, already stacking up to be just more incredible gi action. Absolutely. Andy Murasaki is one of my favorite athletes to watch, gi or no gi. He kind of goes out there and puts it all on the line. Uh, you know, one of the last matches I watched was actually Tynan versus Andy, which Andy wasn't obviously able to get the win. Uh, but now he's going to be able to face down with Tynan's teammate, which I know they've matched up plenty of times before. However, Murasaki's always a, you know, a forward heavy, um, you know, submission oriented athlete. I guess part of my question mark comes around what you, th how you think um, Jonathan responds to, you know, his last performance on the GP. I think there was some calls for, uh, you know, a more action oriented style from him. And I would love to see him make that kind of adjustment because he is one of the most talented athletes in the world. Um, so, you know, having that kind of uh, kinetic, energetic approach to his jiu-jitsu, I think, could really, um, you know, elevate his name uh, ahead of where he's gotten because it does feel like he's right now seen as a little bit of like Tynan's teammate, and he's too good at jiu-jitsu for that to be the place. It, it seems to me like he took a little bit of that criticism to heart, right? Because in the in the IBJJF Absolute Grand Prix, just a, a couple of weeks later, he took on Roosevelt Souza mm -hmm. and. Did not look bad, right? He got mm -hmm. his guard pass, but Roosevelt is, I think, just about double his weight. Yep. Um, and, you know, when, when Jonathan is at his best, we, you know, we see just tremendous work. I think of every Pan Championship in the last three years. Mm -hmm. He has looked just not just dominant, but active and aggressive, a submission hunter, a phenomenal guard passer. I think sometimes just the, the bad overshadows the good, I think unfairly so. Jonathan's jiu-jitsu. Um, his, his style and his flair it's it's really like like watching um, 
he doesn't have the same passing style as Tynan in that it's not wide open, mm -hmm. right? But it's equally as impressive the amount of pressure he's he's able to generate. Um, and coming from a, a guy who's a lightweight competitor, I've, I've rolled with Jonathan, and I, th I think I've told you this, that I rolled with him for three minutes. My feet didn't touch the ground once. <laughs> you know, I just I was yeah. constantly elevated. Um, now, I'm, I'm not anybody to, to compare your jiu-jitsu against, but he, his his style, his guard, his especially his passing are – right up there among the best in the lightweight division. Um, so I'm excited to see what some of the other athletes in this division will bring out of him. Uh, I think Andy being one, if you remember that that pan final, that just stare down, right, where they're mm -hmm. standing there in the center of the mat for what felt like three minutes, just yeah. like locked and loaded, ready to go. I think these two guys have a, a healthy rivalry yeah. that is going to bring the best out of both. Which I love that situation because I don't know why it took so long for them to – I like it, it was very dramatic. They showed down. They faced off. They made eye contact. It was all aggressive. But I don't know if it just like the table work had a problem or there was a camera thing but it did last uncomfortably long <laughs> until I was like oh these two may fight if we give them another 30 <laughs> seconds of just staring at each other's eyes <laughs> one more match that uh, the IBJJF and flow grappling have announced uh, as of earlier this morning this one I'm so excited about the super fight Ronaldo jr. Francisco Lowe mm -hmm. in a super fight at the GP two of the most explosive and exciting and dynamic styles in all of jiu-jitsu today Ronaldo jr. The human highlight reel. Um, I think everybody knows exactly what to expect from his style, right? It's it's a whole lot of uh, big throws big movements a lot of kind of dancing looking passing and just complete disregard for what his <laughs> opponent has to offer yeah. um, and I don't think very many people would have expected the same out of Francisco Lowe until some of the the later opportunities he had to compete in 2022. I'm talking October, November, December, where he put his name on the map by flying triangles and impressive takedowns and big foot sweeps and huge guard passes, showing that he is maybe the next iteration of somebody cut from the same cloth mm -hmm. as Ronaldo Jr. Yeah, and I think, especially since we're talking about gi competition, that type of explosiveness, at least for me as a fan, is very important because it does become the type of martial art that's easy to slow down and cramp in and obviously still wildly technical, still wildly impressive. However, whenever you have two guys, like you said, like Arnaldo Jr., Francisco Lowe, that are both willing to open up, not just one, but they're both willing to do crazy guard passes, they may flat throw someone off the mat, they may do whatever, that's when jiu-jitsu can become really exciting. Uh, I think this is going to be one of those cards that if you have a friend that maybe isn't as into jiu-jitsu or maybe they're like a nogi only kind of person, this may be the perfect match to set them up and go, hey, I told you it can be exciting, guy. Exactly. Shout out to Vitor Freitas. He posted on, uh, on, on our announcement earlier today, this match is kill or be killed. And I couldn't mm -hmm. say it any better myself. Right? That's exactly what both of these athletes bring. Yeah, absolutely. Should be super fun. Um, and, you know, that's not it. We obviously, you got the GP, you got Tynan's uh, main event match. Nothing but good stuff coming from there. Right. Uh, and I do just want to highlight that because you mentioned it, Con uh, Connor. Tynan, Tynan's Alpra versus Izaki Bayans in a 30 minute match. The rematch from their 2021 IBJJF Worlds final. Mm -hmm. um, they've had a lot to say about this match. Maybe we can get into that a little bit next week. Um, but this is going to be probably. The, the Gi Super Fight of the early part of the year, the first quarter of the year. Um, I do want to quickly move on to some stuff taking place this weekend on Sunday, mm -hmm. January 22nd. Big Dan Montessori of New Wave takes on a UFC veteran. Gotta love that. Also, turns out Big Dan can play the piano. I didn't know he could play the piano. I checked out his Instagram. Dude's like <laughs> Mozart. I don't know if Mozart played the piano, but he's he's fantastic. He's also musically talented, and he's going to go out there and try and break this guy's leg. <laughs> How, what more is exciting than that, you know? Big Dan Montessori versus Roger, uh, Roger Navarro, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Narvarez at Sub Hunter Pro 81. Mm -hmm. uh, this tournament, by the way, also going to, uh, also going to contain a, uh, ra groups of four tournaments, so a team tournament, four men per team, fighting for ten thousand uh, dollars. Going to be a really cool event. I love when uh, events and organizations change up the format just a little bit, right? Give us yeah. maybe a different way to to, to uh, approach this. I don't know about some of that tag team or Royal Rumble <laughs> stuff, but every, everything outside of that, I think great opportunity to just experiment with the format of Jiu-Jitsu. And Corey, I think you and I could be tag team champs, and I don't think you should be uh, ruining our options for that, <laughs> all right? But it is very nice whenever you see these events kind of 
taking different um, opportunities to experiment with their show. The fact is, no one has grappling events down to a science yet. So whenever these, uh, you know, tournaments, these events are taking the critiques, they're trying new things, they're pressing new buttons, they're turning new dials. Always fun to see. We're going to hone in on what works. Moving on to January 31st, uh, we mentioned this at the top of the show, but Becoming Dangerous, the rise of Giancarlo Bodoni premieres on January 31st. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to watch the trailer in just a second, but man, I'm so excited to see, uh, to, to watch this film, this documentary that the, the crew here has been hard at work putting together, detailing, recounting Giancarlo's experience at ADCC and the events surrounding ADCC. Yeah, absolutely. I'm... Um I'm not a hater by any means, right? But I remember specifically talking to another member of the Flow Grappling crew about Giancarlo Bodoni's chance to win ADCC pre-tournament, and I did not think it was going to happen. I was I was writing him off a little bit, and uh, th you know I think there's a plenty of moments that we're going to see within the film, uh, probably even the trailer, that really you know the shot came to us all, and I'm excited to relive it. I need some I need some chills here, man. Give me some chills here. We're gonna play this to end the show. So thank you guys for watching another episode of the Grappling Bulletin podcast. Uh, tune in next week. I will be calling in live from Paris, France. Connor will be here or elsewhere or certainly not in Paris, France. I'm just figuring <laughs> this out. So this is great. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be calling in live. Make sure you turn into Euros all week next week, and uh, stay tuned. January 31st, the rise of Giancarlo Bodoni becoming dangerous. Check it out. It's time for the 88 kilogram final. Giancarlo! Oh, Athletes will often overemphasize or overestimate an opponent's ability based on the introduction they have. People looked at Giancarlo previously as just this positional guy that wasn't very dangerous. Oh. I think it's safe to say that Giancarlo has made more progress in his last year with us than he did in his entire career combined. He completely revamped his entire game. And as time went by, he started to create a very new vision in his mind. I punched my ticket. Fighting out of the blue corner, Giancarlo! I just beat the Black Belt World Champion and the last ADCC Champion. It was my fucking weekend. <laughs>